kind of a crowd are you? <laughs> Second of all, I'm so thankful to Dr. Madsen for the tremendous, consistent work that she's doing on these topics. I love that UVU is known for this kind of research, this kind of community presence. This, this wasn't a warm-up act, Valerie. This is, like a, this is like a New York Metropolitan Opera aria. <laughs> Nobody can follow the standing ovation and the information you gave. So I'm happy to just be the little dessert snack afterward. <laughs> but what I love about following in the position of this program is we have a chance to think about all of that data, all of that research, this, this thing that's so close to your heart and the way we felt it. We felt what that's like. And now have a chance to talk about, but what are we going to do? <laughs> what are we going to do now that we know this? And how can it work in the situations that we have that are, that are you know, our lives, the way they are? So I like this topic because we're talking about becoming global citizens. And I hope that every single one of us walks out of here with something in your heart that you care a lot about that you're going to do. I can't create that, but maybe you can. Maybe there will be something with you that you say, OK, I'm going to do something that I haven't been doing before. If we did that, I don't know how many people are in this room, but a lot, and people that are watching you know, online, if every person did that, the energy just in Utah would shift. Think what that would do if we just chose each one thing. So I have the very interesting position of being in the leadership of two global organizations, as, as Sister Dalton said. The, the Relief Society, we now have 7.5 million members in, in 162 countries. And think of the leadership that they provide. In 33,000 congregations, there are nine women you know, providing leadership as part of that leadership council. I get to be part of that at the general uh, level, which is, which is really fascinating for me to watch how dynamics work and how we work in family levels, but at this global level too. I also am this president of Latter-day Saint Charities. We work in... 189 countries every year we do more than 2,000 projects we work with partnerships from the United Nations all the way down to you know midwife associations very very interesting to be part of these at the same time both of these organizations have a grassroots component because we're talking about families that work and women that belong to the Relief Society and what do they do in their own spheres uh, which is grassroots, and also Latter-day Saint Charities at the congregational level. What do we do about emergencies? And what do we do about the situations that arise out of the communities that we live in, that are poverty and hunger and those kinds of things? So my point is, we, I, there's a global component and global organizations, and there's also a grassroots component. And finally, I want to talk about the individual component. Where, where's Grace? Did she come? Is she here? All right, she's not here. <laughs> but, but I got introduced to Grace's mom. Where's Grace's mom? Oh. <laughs> Would you just stand up for just a second? <laughs> Thanks for recognizing that your name is Grace and that you're here. <laughs> Grace just returned from a mission to Singapore and Malaysia. Singapore and Malaysia. Now, why did you come tonight? Okay, that's not a throwaway reason. We're here because of the way we're connected, right? We come because we care about the same things. What do you want out of tonight? Um, just to learn, like, I think where I was living in Singapore and Malaysia, I felt like I was like giving back a lot, and I guess coming back here, I just kind of learned how I can make a difference locally. Thank you. Everybody, thank you. You can sit. <laughs> Everybody in this room. <laughs> Everybody in this room is grace. We're looking for that kind of grace in our lives. We want to figure out how can I give back? How can I make a difference? How can my actions matter to me and the people I'm connected with and the place that I live? You're a perfect example. You did really well. The World Bank did a study, and it, it came out in 2014. I can't even compare it to the study that we've just seen. But it talked about if you want to make situations better for the statistics about poverty, violence, all the things that Dr. Hudson talked about. You need to focus on two things. This is World Bank. You need to focus on agency and you need to focus on voice. Well, I'm extremely interested in this because I think about agency in a religious context. But here's their definition of agency. 
it says, uh, the capacity to make decisions about one's own life and act on them to achieve a desired outcome, free of violence, retribution, or fear. So you can see how this feeds into the, some of the things Dr. Hudson talked about. Voice, the capacity to speak up and be heard from homes to houses of parliament. It's the ability to shape and share in discussions and decisions that affect the person themselves. All right, so let's think about tonight agency and voice, the ability to decide what happens to you and to affect that, and then voice to be able to have your perspective heard and taken into account. So what does it look like when men and women support each other's agency and voice? And I, I reject the, the idea that if for, in order for women to progress, men have to lose. Or in order for matriarchy to get its due, patriarchy has to lose. I just, I won't believe that. I'm dedicated to the idea that it is the interdependence of men and women, particularly when it's focused on the rising generation, that is what creates change. Now you could see some of that that we talked about here. What does that kind of interdependence around agency and voice look like? Of course this is anecdotal because I'm just going to read anecdotal, but we have a book's worth, 602 pages, <laughs> that will back up the anecdotes. But this is a woman in Ecuador. She's talking about what this looks like in her own life. I have free space to decide for myself, no longer dependent on others. For me, it is a source of pride that my husband asks my advice. Now there isn't machismo, there is mutual respect. Together we decide. In her household in Ecuador, that's what that looks like. This is a man in Vietnam. Happiness and equality are related. If the husband understands that and is supporting and helping his wife, the happiness of the whole family will be reinforced. And this is a man in Niger. The woman helps the man manage the household. It's a partnership. We want it that way. Here in town, a man does better when his wife contributes. So these are three families that have found that intersection between the, the interdependence of men and women and what it looks like for them. And they feel the benefits that are coming back to them and to their family too. So almost every study will say that the interdependence of men and women working together and, and safeguarding everybody's equal access to agency, the ability to decide, and voice, it creates benefits that flow back. Now the World Bank says those benefits are psychological and economic. We've talked today about the security benefits of that. This is the question of the 21st century. The thing that we're talking about today would have more impact if we can understand it and affect change than any other thing. It affects every person on this planet. So, I thought today, you don't get this kind of cultural behavioral change from World Bank reports, and you don't even get them from academic studies. We don't change our behavior that way. How do we change our behavior? by experiences. Experiences change our minds from the old traditional thing we were doing to the new thing. So in order to make this work, we have to have new experiences. And for me, we all have the chance to participate in some of those. So I thought I would spend today talking about new kinds of experiences that have helped change people's minds, if you'll just allow me. So I have to remember, oh, there's my first slide that I should have shown. <laughs> I want to talk about the ways that global organizations are strong. There are strengths that global, big global organizations have that it's helpful for us to know when we want to, to talk about changing experiences. The first strength that they have is to aggregate tiny efforts into a big impact. And the, the example that I'm using is from Latter-day Saint Charities. 1985, there's a cyclical famine in the Horn of Africa, and it's devastating. The BBC did a seven-minute broadcast on this and in the pre-Instagram times it went viral. All of the news agencies picked it up and watched it. Well, all kinds of people all over the church and the communities looked at this and they said, we ha we, surely we can do something. Now, you, you have Queen giving their, you know, their big concert and you have Live Aid and you have, pe everybody was energized. What can we do? How can this be the 20th century that people would starve at that level and we would not do something about that? So, in the tradition of the Latter-day Saint Church, 
we decided we would fast, going without eating for two meals and then taking that money that somebody else might be able to eat. So I go without eating that somebody else might eat. And in a lot of ways, it's an elegant solution because anybody can participate. Anybody can do that. It takes small little bits of money and it brings it together from two fasts in 1985, $10 million was raised. $10 million was a lot of money. <laughs> then the church says, what are we going to do with the 10 million? What can we do that will be effective to actually? So this is a picture of a very young M. Russell Ballard, his plaid <laughs> shirt. And he was a brand new apostle and he was sent to Ethiopia to look at who's doing work that matters, who's doing work that makes a difference. And he went with Glenn Pace and they were responsible for giving that money to agencies that were making a difference. Now, I, I just love that photo of him. <laughs> they did several things. They worked in partnership with the Red Cross, with Africare, with Catholic Relief Services. Catholic Relief are the ones who said, we'll show you how to do this. <laughs> you're new, you're new to this. Let us show you what it looks like to do famine relief. We're very grateful for that partnership. They are Latter-day Saint Charity's oldest partner. And they worked on weighing kids and educating parents and providing a meal that people couldn't eat before regular food. They did big berms and, and dams to hold back water to increase so that when there is another drought, they have more access to water. They did a lot of work. It took eight years to spend that $10 million. But even 20 years later, when we went back to look, those water catchment places are still in operation. So we were happy about that to aggregate small efforts for a big impact. That's one thing that big global organizations do well. Now this is the sustainable development goals. This is the United Nations saying, if we cooperate, if we coordinate all of these efforts around these 17 goals, we can make progress and we'll collect impact and we'll, we'll, we'll all work together on certain things. And they're driving a vision, an agenda about that. So that's another good thing that global organizations do. Global organizations can go to a national government and they could say, what are your mandates? What are your priorities? What help do you need? And then they augment or help sustain those national governments. And I've just put three of our partners here. This is a, this is a school lunch program in Durban, South Africa. So the, Af the government said, we don't have school lunch and our children lack uh, nutrition. Parents want to contribute. Can you help us set it up? So these were our partners, Catholic Relief, Islamic Relief, and Israel Aid. Nice. Nice little faith group there. This is one of the fathers, and I think they're growing cabbages in the back. But they, they provide school lunch and the gardening for the school lunch for 40 different schools, and the trucking system, and all the parents are out there. It was, it was a fabulous little project. Another strength of global organizations is that they can cross borders for common problems. Because problems don't get, they don't get not neatly contained in national borders or just neighborhoods. They, they sprawl everywhere. So the Relief Society, President Bingham has said, we're going to work as a Relief Society on the four things that stop women from engaging in Relief Society. And they are nutrition, when we're young, literacy and education, preventing abuse, and emotional stability. Those are the things that prevent people from actually moving on and taking those things. So she's, she's using her platform and, and the work in the councils to, to work on some of those things. Another strength of global organizations is in conflict, conflict and disaster relief, we, we can sometimes go places where other people can't go. A great example is the famine in Yemen right now. Yemen is so unstable because of the coup, because of the fighting, everything else. Aid workers get killed there all the time. But we're working with certain partners that have a commitment that they'll stay. Now, when there's a disaster, when there's a relief, and you start seeing video of you know, people who've left their house with their chainsaws and they go out to Texas and they spend their vacation chainsawing up hurricane sites and things like that. That gets created not because of individuals. If you send a bunch of individuals with chainsaws into a disaster zone, <laughs> it's going to create some more disaster. <laughs> But when global organizations are able to, to, to provide structure for that, then it's incredibly powerful what is able to be done with that. All right, let's talk about the strengths of grassroots organizations, which are very different. The first one is, and I often remember this story, I was after the Southeast Asia tsunami, in, I was in Sri Lanka, which is that little pear-shaped island off the coast of India. And we were, we were driving from one place to another, and we stopped at the place 
where the, the country train goes laterally across the country. It's up on tracks. And people heard that the tsunami might be coming. And they took children and handed them up to the people in the train because it was elevated on the track and it would be high. And when the wave hit, it took that train and just tumbled it. And, uh, and 1,700 people died in the train. So this is five months later. And I'm there working on housing and, and helping fishermen get their boats back. And, and we've driven packed where to this, and it's suddenly where the train is. And we get out of the car so that I can see it. And there are families camped all around that train five months later. And there's a big sheet that's tacked to the train that says something in, in the language. And so I asked Shanta, who was my driver and my interpreter, I said, what does that say? And he said, we now respect the power of the sea because we, it took our children from us. So these are families who lost their children in that train, and they're frozen. They, they, don't, they don't know how to go anywhere. And everyone came up to me, you know, touching my hand and saying the English that they knew, I lost my baby. I lost my father. Help me. And I didn't have any ability to do one thing there. I can't explain to them what I'm doing. I can't talk about the housing that we're trying to get funding for or the fishermen's boats. I have nothing to offer them. But Shanta does. He speaks the language. He gets a soccer ball out. He starts playing soccer with the kids. He starts asking the parents what's happening, what's going on. I didn't have any ability to be effective in that situation because I don't understand the culture and I don't speak the language. And this is brutal. But it's true. We're most effective where we live because we understand those things. We have the strength. It's exotic, and we get motivated by building schools in Peru. But we are most effective in Utah County because we stay here. We live here. We get the dynamics here. We speak the language. So that is one, one thing. Oh, I just want to say, this is, this is from the Democratic Republic of Congo. And the issue was they need more protein in their diet. If I had solved this problem, I would not have brought a duck in a basket. <laughs> but they do, because this is going to work for their situation. So all those sisters, those women, sat around, and they learned what to do with that duck. <laughs> I don't have the ability to teach this class, but they do. <laughs> There's the duck all plucked, roasting on the charcoal. And there's the family eating the duck. <laughs> so they've just learned how to prepare a local solution for a local issue, and everybody learned that skill. And everybody enjoyed that duck. <laughs> Another strength of local grassroots organizations is you've got to find solutions to fit the circumstances. Now, Sister Bingham just came back from the Philippines, where they did, uh, by stake, they were doing how many children under five have signs of malnourishment. So they did the protocols, they did the weighing and the measuring and the height. The stake president said, you know what, I don't think we have a problem in our stake. I don't think we have any. Everybody is eating, everybody is full. And that turned out to be true. Everybody is eating, but they're eating instant noodles or white rice. So of 129 kids that were screened in one day, only one child was in the green. 60% of them were in the red, which means that there's stunting going on. So what do you do about that? So everybody was shocked and amazed. The traditional solution from NGOs is we need to provide supplements to the kids. We're going we're to buy supplements in the market, and they're going to have to eat those supplements. But that's not a sustainable solution. Family said, we can't afford those supplements. We, and we don't want to be dependent on an NGO to bring in those supplements. So what do they do? They got together as a council in their whole community, and they said, well, we're going to grow our own nutritious food. We're going to have parenting classes and nutrition classes. We're going to do cooking things. And so here are these parents of these kids making these little seedlings. And as you go out, they've planted those seedlings into these big acres. And every day, parents are assigned to come work on that. And then their mantra is, don't eat white. <laughs> eat green, eat orange, eat yellow, but don't eat white. <laughs> and that's a, that's a definite solution. Would I have come up with that solution? Probably not because I'm going to come up with brochures and training and PowerPoints. And that's not going to work in the Philippines. But they found something that works. Another strength of grassroots organizations is that they're nimble to adjust. This woman is named Eva Syed. She's a nurse, and she's in northern Iraq. 
And her passion is training of nurses. Nurses don't get strong training, especially continuing training. So she's, her passion is to build a facility, to bring people in, to take training to wherever people are. And in the middle of her dream, with the government support that she had from Baghdad and, and Erbil, the war happened. ISIS invaded, and her whole dream is shot because people can't travel. But because the program was based on her, she's there, she's Kurdish, she lives there, she gets the population. She modified the training program to actually take advantage of the situation with the war and to be able to treat people who were uh, f f uh, injured in the war or people who were in the camps. She actually trained the whole, she changed the whole program to be nimble to address the new need. Now, if you work closely with the United Nations, that doesn't ever happen. <laughs> you, don't, you don't turn a giant ship like that to a nimble need. It, it, takes, it takes years and studies and all kinds of things. But grassroots organizations are able to be very nimble and, and move. My favorite thing, this is low bureaucracy and personal relationships. And that's for sure true. The way that Grace feels about the people she's with, that's how we make change. Now I'm with my friend Kathy, she's in the slide there. You can tell she's having fun. What's going on in that photo? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're eating dinner. This is part of a circle thing and you're having, at least you're eating, aren't you? Yes, Okay. Yes. All right. Low bureaucracy, personal relationships. Now, in order for us to be the leaders of this kind of change, I want to talk about some characteristics, leadership characteristics that actually make a difference if you're trying to implement some of these things. And I'm going to highlight some of the, the organizations that maybe work in our community, but I also want to highlight individuals. Because you've got global organizations, you've got grassroots organizations, but I never want to discount the power of individuals themselves to, to create change at that family level, at the dynamics of what's going on in our own families. I think that changes the world. Now. My friend, who's come, will you just stand by me just for a minute? Come, come up here, so everybody can see you. <laughs> this, is, this is Manu Chakos. You're from the Dem Democratic Republic of Congo. Yes. How long have you lived in the United States? 30 years. 30 years. Manu had how many children? Four together. Four all together. So you have a stepson and three children of your own. Yes. She was m married when you came, mm -hmm. but not married now. No, I'm divorced. Divorced. Had to, s to support those kids. Yes. How many of your children graduated from high school? All of them. All of them. How many of them graduated to college? And you be you, three of them. Three of them from <laughs> where, where does your son work? I'm Governor Hatch in Washington, D.C. Okay, he's been working with Governor, I mean, with uh, Senator Hatch. Senator. Yeah, in in for two years. Yeah, two years, and he's gonna come back to go to another two years. Where did you experience your uh, refugee experience? Where did you come from before you came to the United States? Nairobi, Kenya. Right, and how long were you in Nairobi? Four years. I mean, two, I mean four months. Four months. <laughs> so you can just a little glimpse of what has happened in Manu's life, and yet what has happened in her experience refuses to define her because. You've changed everything for your family. Your four children have a completely different experience yes. because of you. Because I have a dream. Because you have a dream. <laughs> if you spent more time with Manu, you would hear, she knocked on the door, she called up, she said, my skill is to call people up and tell them what I need. She called up Habitat for Humanity and said, look, I need a house. And they said, okay. So her family <laughs> built their house. <laughs> and she, aren't you proud of your house? Yeah, I had my house for 15 years. 15 years. <laughs> this is a tremendous story of somebody who says, I'm not gonna wait and, and wait for somebody to organize something for me. I have the power inside me to ask, to, to work, to grow. Now, Manu is a, is a, she's a graduate of CIRCLES program. Anybody familiar with CIRCLES? Besides Kathy, who's the director. <laughs> <laughs> CIRCLES is, is, if you're a CIRCLE leader, that means that you are Manu. You're taking charge of the change you want to see in your life. And CIRCLES brings allies around you. 
mentors, other people, friends, who are going to encourage you and support you? Well, Manu's a graduate. You graduated from being a leader, and now you're an ally. So now she's an ally for other people. Just, just tell me, one, you told me right before, just stand up one more time. <laughs> What, what did you do at Wendy's today or yesterday? Uh, I took one of the sisters. She's a refugee. She lived in this country for four years and she doesn't speak English. So I make a phone call and say, Can we talk? Or we sit down and talk. She talk about jobs. She's talking about her children. And I say, Okay, I'm going to go downtown. I went I sneak up. I went to Wendy and talked to one of the boss manager. And I say, I have a sister who doesn't speak English. She's a shame like me. So, can you give her job? And he said, yeah, bring her up. <laughs> so, I bring her to Wendy. And then the manager interviewed the daughter and the mother, fill up all the application form and get a job. Because I do know that woman, she looked like me 30 years ago. Yeah, she exactly, she looked like me. So I have to reach to some of our sister who came to this country, a refugee who are shy, they don't speak the language. That's what I do, and I'm gonna continue to do. I also have some kids in Africa. I'm helping them to buy a backpack for school. <laughs> she helped me, and I, when I go to Africa and I give to all the children in the, my own town, make sure I, every kids have to go to school and have a shoes on their feet. Look at the power of Manu. <laughs> I just, I didn't want to tell her story. I want you to meet her because of the power of individuals at the individual level. I don't want to ever discount that. And you got somebody a job. You helped somebody get a job. And I just love that. So don't wait to be the change that you seek. If we, people say all the time to me, the church should do this. The government should do this. And I think we are those people. They are us. <laughs> we should. But I don't ever want to wait for somebody else to organize something or plan something. I'll be the one. Like, can we be the ones to do that? The second that we learn that lesson, the power of that lesson, that I don't need to wait for somebody to organize something, everything shifts. And I can see in your faces you already know this. When you decide, I don't need to wait for somebody else to plan this, I have the power of the hope and the energy, things shift. And I'm tremendously energized by that idea. So, amen. amen. <laughs> Let me give a couple of examples. Because we just celebrated the 100th anniversary of women's suffrage in Utah, I just had to talk about Martha Hughes Cannon. So, in the late 1870s, the health situation in, in the Utah Valley, in the, in the Pioneer Valleys along here, was terrible. And, and diphtheria, we don't get diphtheria anymore, but diphtheria killed 749 people in one year. And one of the reasons it killed people was midwives and nurses would, some were very good at delivering babies and they didn't have any mortality. But others weren't, weren't skilled at hygiene practices and they went from family to family spreading diphtheria. So Martha Hughes Cannon, she decides, we got to do something about that. The Relief Society was sponsoring the tuition for certain women to go back east and become doctors, and Martha says, I'll do it. So she goes back east. She actually was one of the very few people who did not have to have an interview because her credentials were so uh, impressive. So she, she went to medical school in University of Michigan Medical School, and she didn't even have to have an interview. So she goes. She comes back and she works her whole life in public health. And, she, and the, in, the infant mortality rate went down, the disease rate went down. She trained all kinds of nurses and doctors. These women set up Deseret Hospital. They, they trained midwives. These six women doctors who went back in the 1870s and then came back to Utah had a profound effect on the health in these valleys. Well, in 1896, she decides to run for the Utah State Legislature. Among other people, she beat out her husband. <laughs> she was the Democratic nominee. And she won. So what's one of the first things, if you're Dr. Cannon, what are you going to do? She puts forward a bill to create the Public Health Office of Utah. 
And so she, it, that was very revolutionary in the 1870s, 1880s, 1890s. So when you normally go around to your business and you see this government entity that says, Utah Department of Health, Cannon Health Building, I just want you to know, why is that named the Cannon Health Building? Yeah, Martha Hughes Cannon. She created that. She created some of that infrastructure. She went on, she was the first female state legislator in the country. And she had all of that impact. Why? Because she didn't wait around for somebody to open the door. She organized that. She made those differences. Now, every person in this room could tell those stories about that. We've heard Manu's, and I think it's a great one. Let me just tell one more. I had the chance to meet Sarah Bateman last year at the, uh, the LDS Earth Stewardship. She won an award there. She lives in Orem, and she looks around in Orem, and she says, this place is going to explode with growth. What do I care about? I care about protecting the reason I moved to Orem. I want bike paths. I want a clean air. I want to protect the watershed. I want to protect parks. So she started several different things. The first one is she founded Orem's Natural Resource Stewardship Committee, and they focus on recycling and water conservation and biking and gardening. And she says, I'm a gentle diplomat. I have a sincere love for the people. My work requires communication and persuasion. Patience and persistence are my ever-present companions. It takes a lot of faith and optimism. But I love that she's doing that. Now, one of the things that she started in 2008 is the Orem Community Free Swap. Anybody been? You take stuff that you don't want anymore, you put them out on tables, and other people come, and in these four pictures, you can see what they wanted. So this guy got a violin, and look how happy he is, or she is. <laughs> Those people got books, but the, it's just a free, and people can't believe that it's free. And low-income people, refugees, they ask several times, it's okay to take this, it's free. And for her, it's part of recycling. We're just, we're just transferring resources. But for 12 years, that's been going on. Just one of the many examples that, that uh, Sarah did. So those are examples. My question to you is, what will you do? What will you do without waiting for somebody else that they should organize something? What will you do? The next thing I want to talk about is nurturing personal, lasting relationships. When I first became the director of Latter-day Saint Charities, the month after I was appointed, there was an audit. We have these regular audits, but I didn't know, I didn't know what to do. There was, a, there was an accountant named Lori Sims who was very experienced, and she sat in my office and explained to me in language that I could understand the very complicated financial instruments that were being used as part of this audit. Now, Lori passed away just last weekend, and I felt deep grief about that. She's the accountant that I work with at work, but I felt that way. Why? Because she took a personal interest in me. Not a business interest, but a personal interest in helping me be better at my job. This is President Bingham. And this is the Afghan mother and daughter that she befriended and was their English teacher like 23 years ago when they first came to the United States. They have no idea what it means to be the General Relief Society president. They call her all the time. We want to see you. We're going to bring you food. We want to. And she loves the relationship because of that. And she would, she would never be able to say, I, I'm traveling too much, I'm too busy. This is one of her primary relationships. And it, it produces change. It produces change in their lives and then the lives that they affect others. This is the one I want to show you about. This is going to be four minutes, and you're going to see what circle leaders and allies do together. And notice, when you watch this video, the agency and the voice. At the Adventist Community Center in Provo, people gather for a meal, but the occasion is not a church supper. Most of poverty are the people that you see that you would have no idea that they're struggling to find out which bill to pay. It's a weekly evening meeting of the Provo branch of Utah Circles. These are folks who work together to reach a goal, getting out of poverty. We've been married for about 11 and a half years and we've been below the poverty line for 10 of that. We've had um, moments where we were both unemployed. We got evicted from apartments because of that. In nine years, we moved 10 times, um, just between living with relatives and, and trying to find a place of our own. It was, it was rough, especially with little ones. It was just survival mode, day to day, and uh, we just didn't know how to get out of it. There's just no way you can get out of the rent cycle or, um, 
just to keep moving. How do you how do you get that dream to take your family to Disneyland, or how do you how are you going to ever get enough to retire? Nothing distracts from the object of every meeting, making and following up on individual plans to get out of poverty. There are two groups of people here. Circle leaders, those working to improve their financial situations, and community volunteers who've agreed to become the circle leaders' friends and allies. People who struggle in poverty tend to um, become more and more isolated and their social capital goes down, and it's a downward spiral. So the idea of circles is to reverse that. We tell our circle leaders or our clients, okay, you are directing your path. You get to move forward how you want and how you decide because you know yourself best. So their circle is their circle leader, their allies, me as the coach, and outside community resources. Those who've met the requirements to become a circle leader have a stable housing situation and no medical or mental health issues that would block their progress. They learn about goal setting, they work on defining the path out of poverty, and they are matched with the allies that will support them in their journey. I jump ahead and have a hard time breaking things down and explaining what it is I have going on in my mind. So he helped me, he helps me break that down so I can take those small steps rather than, okay, here's the big jump that I have to take. You're not their coach. You don't know more than they do in the sense of their situation and how to get out of it. You're, we're just teaming you up as friends and you would help them as you would help your friend. Circles can be an opportunity to join family to family in pursuit of a better life for both, as is the case with Anthony and Sherry working with Jim and Kim. It's been a huge booster having friends. We've had some down moments the last few months and having somebody that we can call or text or just to say, hey, I, I'm, I need somebody, and they're there. It's fun to be in our role because we advocate and suggest, but at the end of the day, we're, we're just there to say, you can do this, you know, with what's and your goal. And they really make their own goals. Yeah. So. It's fun. And they just come at you and say, well, uh, tell you what, let's let's hold on a bit longer and see what else comes down the road because uh, something something good will always come along. We just have to have the patience to uh, and the, the and the fortitude to recognize that. Everything we've done, we, we we're not allowed in the circles program to give money. We're not allowed. So all we're doing is giving encouragement, support, and connecting them with with people that we. They, that they don't know that they should know. We've hooked them up with uh, Rachel, who hooked them up with a friend, who got Anthony some help he needed at school. Think about agency and voice and how that's being used there, and the interdependence of those couples and how they work with each other and how they learn from each other, that exchange. I think that's a practical application of all of that data that we saw earlier tonight. So, anyway. My last thing, the last leadership characteristic that I want to talk about is not letting issues destroy common ground. We work and live in a place of polarity. Everything's being driven into black and white, where there's actually a lot of gray. The example that I wanted to, to live, does anybody know who this is? <laughs> Pamela Atkinson. We love her, and she is an advocate for the homeless, for suicide prevention, for, for many kinds of things. She's an elder in the First Presbyterian Church, but she has she grew up in poverty herself. She told me she didn't know that not everybody put cardboard in their shoes, and she didn't know that people used sheets until she slept over at one of her friends from school and saw that all the beds had sheets on them. She'd never seen that before. So she grew up from, with a single mom in London in poverty. But at 14, she decided, I'm going to change my life, and education is the way that I can change my life. So she first she became qualified as a nurse. She moved to Australia. She came to the United States. She eventually found her way to Utah. Now, Governor Herbert calls her the Mother Teresa of Utah. She hates that. But <laughs> if you're filling out your taxes and you can put part of your refund in the Pamela Atkinson Homelessness Trust, you go down to the Fourth Street Clinic for the, for the health clinic there. It's called the Pamela Atkinson Clinic. People have done those things for her. She gave eight characteristics that that make it work for her, and Forbes published this. So I just wanted to share them with you. The first one is, ego has no role in service. It's not about you, it's about them. The second, 
It's about collaborating. You have to find ways to, to find common ground and then to build on that. It's about collaboration. You're going to give a little bit, they're going to give a little bit, but you're going to get farther than you were. The third one is don't be afraid to speak out. She talks about sometimes she's the only person in the room and she just feels the awkward silence that, that um, Gloria Steinem talked about. But if you don't speak out, other people cannot bring their energy around that idea later on. You have to be the one to speak. And she's uh, a good example of that. She said, don't give up. If people turn her down, she is the most successful fundraiser the state has ever seen. And if you turn Pamela down, which I have had to do many times, she'll say, what could I do to change your mind? <laughs> and then you have that discussion. <laughs> Everyone can do something. She tells a story. She was actually teaching this. Everyone can do something. And a woman said, there's nothing that I can do. I live on a limited income. I don't have a car. I'm 82 years old, and I live below the poverty line. There's nothing I can do. And Pamela said, I challenge you to donate a can of soup once a week to the food bank. And she said, fine. <laughs> <laughs> but over a year, that represented hundreds of meals, a can of soup to the food bank. So there's always something everyone can do. One of my least favorite aspects of, of modern charity work is that we think it's about money. It's not about the money. It's about the, the personal investment. It's about the relationship. It's about these leadership skills. The power of touch and a smile. If you go out with Pamela, which I do often, working with people that are they're living on the streets, and you'll find people that are sleeping behind a hedge, she'll always reach down and touch them on the shoulder to wake them up. Very gentle. When she hands out supplies or socks or something, she always squeezes their hand because she was serving food for the first time in the Salvation Army, some other place, and the general of the, of the Salvation Army, he said they haven't had touch in weeks. They, they hunger for that personal connection, and she's always remembered that, and she implements that. She always says, never let an issue interfere with the relationships, and that's true. We live in a slash and burn. If you aren't my way, it's over. The relationship is finished, and Pamela always says, we we may not agree, but we'll always have a relationship We're, because that's the most important thing. And avoid emotional bankruptcy. You have to take care of yourself. You can't be a strength in your community if you are running empty yourself. So make sure you take care of yourselves. I want to just bring this up. There are many, many ways that we can help. But one of the effective ways is the platform of Just Serve that connects people who want to do something with people who need something. So I put in 84606 because I couldn't remember the zip code for UVU. <laughs> but it says there's 103 opportunities within five miles of here. OK. What are they? OK, these are just the first ones that come up. There's 97 that don't show here. Become a circle's ally. Fight poverty by being one of those allies that we saw in the film. Donate dinner for people that are coming to the circles meeting. Drive people to their cancer appointments that are in recovery. Work with refugees preparing their resumes. Uh, help them in different ways to get integrated. Show them around the community. Be an after school reading and math tutor to elementary school kids. There's 97 more. But there, these are opportunities. These are ways that you can look to. And please post on Just Serve if you have opportunities as well. I'll conclude with this. Last week was the ninth anniversary of me being in Syria on this trip. I was there working with the University of Damascus on their dairy herd. So there I am on the phone ordering bull semen from Canada to be shipped to Syria with a U.S. domestic uh, you know, a Department of Commerce license. What do I know about that? But I do now. <laughs> Trying to improve their dairy herd. So I traveled. We're working with the agriculture doctors and uh, did quite a lot of work there. As part of that, I went up, drove the road up through Homs, through Hama, all the way up to Aleppo to talk about the maternal newborn training we were going to be doing with the medical school there in six months. Looked at the facilities, uh, negotiated with the president to, to use the dormitories, that kind of thing. And then church security called me and they said, you know, there's these demonstrations that are happening in Damascus. Very peaceful, but why don't you get out of town? So. <laughs> I took the Latter-day Saint Charities couple with me, and we rode a bus, three, a city bus, three hours south to a place called Basra, where there were some uh, Roman ruins. But every day, the security situation got a little bit tighter, and I left. 
And then uh, that was in February. So that was nine years ago, February. And that was the very beginning whispers of this horrific, unbelievably cataclysmic war. And it's just one war that's going on. There are many places. But for me, because I drove those roads, because I was with those people, it's personal to me. And I followed the, the, the terribleness of this war. 6.7 million Syrians are outside the country. And another 6 million are displaced inside. They are middle class. They are people just like us, sitting in universities, taking their tests. What has happened there became personal to me. And so this is an area just outside of Aleppo, outside of the university where I was. When I look at this level of destruction and I think, what can I do? As, as president of, a, of an organization that, that works on disaster relief, but I don't know what to do about that. It's so big. We have to understand there are things that we can do as global organizations, as grassroots organizations, as, as individuals, and we should do them. And there will always be things that we can't do. And we have to accept those things with grace, too. Now, I don't believe anything is impossible. That's my driveway. I come out to get in my car. How did that happen? <laughs> There's a scripture in Mark 10. The, uh, the disciples come to Jesus and they say, he, he, he's, he, he said, they said, they're talking about wealth and riches. And he said, it's harder for somebody with their money to get into the kingdom of God than it is for a, the camel to go through the eye of the needle. And they're shocked. If, the, if that's true, who can be saved? And then he says the thing that is so helpful to me. With man, it's impossible. But with God, all things are possible. So that, I don't know what to do about that. But I, with my faith, I have to trust that God sees those people, he hears their prayers, and he responds in ways that are godly and divine. And I'm committed that I will use my energy and my power to do everything that I can and then count on him. And this is my other favorite thing. For things that are dead, for things that are rotten, that you think there is no hope, there is always hope hope. So I challenge you, whatever you have felt, whatever you looked at and you have an idea in your mind, go do that thing. Do it individually, do it as a grassroots and join with global organizations, but be that kind of change and use these leadership principles and give evidence to the fact that men and women can work together and make the change that we see for our security, for our economics, and most of all for our families and our children. Thanks very much.